We're going to share some stories of weird, creative miking. When we talk about them, you'll see that there are very unconventional things that can absolutely sound amazing, and you can come up with those yourself as well. This is the Self-Recording Band Podcast, the show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tyne, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? Hello. I'm great, man. I survived Black Friday weekend, somewhat. <laughs> you did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I did better than you by the sounds of things. <laughs> yep. I didn't tell you the whole story, like the truth. Um, we were talking about this last episode, and I was, and I said, I'm basically only gonna do like business subscriptions, yearly plans, save money, all that crap. And I did that, but I also bought a lot of stuff more than I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oddly, I feel super jealous though. I've got like a link open to that camera you mentioned. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. That, that camera is great. That camera is super fun. I bought like every accessory for it that you can imagine like the the stand and like a little cage where you can mount it on the stand and like the cam link where you can record directly to your computer without you having to use a card how is that is that awesome that is awesome you can use it as a webcam okay. basically and you can just record into ScreenFlow. but it's just like recording into a DAW, and you don't have to wow, like, yeah. search through files and cards and stuff so it's awesome that's really cool yeah I definitely would like one of those. And that camera doesn't have the annoying like um, time limit when you do videos because some cameras shut off after a couple of minutes or whatever. And you can do mm. unlimited basically with this camera until it overheats. But that didn't happen to me so far. Great. Um, Great. Did you get any uh, music stuff? Yes. Um, so I got this like um, that I told you this um, podcast arm th thingy like... Um, Mic it's arm. like a mic stand, boom mic stand, arm. Mic arm yeah, thing. Like the, the stuff you see like Joe Rogan use for kind of swoops in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this one, but I got like fun music stuff as well. What did I get? I um I bought uh the Pulsar Mu plugin that I was talking about last time. I got that. I've cool. finally upgraded to the whole Sound Toy suite. I almost got all their plugins anyways, just a couple of missing, so it was pretty cheap to upgrade to that, but I finally did that. Um I did. I bought Saturn Fab Filter because Great, you're welcome. always talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you like it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I definitely think I will. Then I got the um, like you know uh, Corneff Audio, like Dan Corneff's plugins. Oh, yeah, the AIP. Exactly. I got that one. I got that too. That's on mine. <laughs> yeah. So that's super sick. Um, I, at least I hope it's going to be super sick. I mean, what I saw and heard from videos and other people is super amazing, but I haven't tried it myself yet. But it looks yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I haven't tried it yet either. I, I just caved at the last moment last night um, and got it. Because, like, I, I have their uh, their Pawn Shop Comp, um, which is, like, my one of my favorite plugins. It's just so freaking yeah. cool and good. Uh, so I was just like, you know what? I trust them. I'm sure it's awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got... And, like, I mean... <laughs> You can always you always find ways to like justify purchases, but in this case, yes. I really, uh, I really um, needed or want wanted not needed but wanted something new on my guitar or rhythm bus. Right. Uh, I, I've, I went through a couple of options there during the last couple of months, and I was never hundred percent happy. So maybe this one will do the trick, um, but it's not like people. I, I don't want to. I don't want people to think that some plugin or or hardware or whatever. Um, is necessary for anything like i i did fine with what i have but i just wanted something new yeah 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 it, that's that's just it these aren't they're just like for fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's like that's all it is at this point like we have so many tools and it's just like i just want this this is just me buying like it's like me buying a new guitar just to play it's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a toy really yeah a useful toy yeah totally. but uh yeah totally. I, I so i got that uh Corniff audio aip channel strip as well but i also got spiff um oh good from oek good which i'm very happy but i've like demoed that like three times over the years you know like this kept renewing the demos every year being like all right you're allowed to demo it again and i was like all right i'll try it again and every time i loved it but i just it's not something i would use all the time i think so i just never bought it but mm. i went for it yeah i use soothe all the time so yeah and um, uh our our mutual friend diego uses spiff 
constantly. Every time I send him like a mix to check out, he's like opens it up and changes stuff with Spiff. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I use it all the time as well. And I basically have two applications for it. One is I just open it and use the default setting, like just the default factory setting. Um, I love that on kick and snare and drums. It's just like, I don't know, it's instantly punch. I just dial in the mix knob or the the, the depth or whatever it's called to the point where I like Very it, cool. but it's just increase. It increases the attack. It jumps out of the speakers a little more and I like it way more than a usual like transient designer. So that's just the default setting that always works for me on kick and snare. I don't know why. So that's one of the uses. And the other, and Perfect. that's that's what it's really, really great for is like to remove pops, clicks, mouth noises, um, sibilance and stuff in vocals. So I always run, almost always run vocals through an instance of Spiff to clean up the top end and all the yeah the noisy stuff. Ah. It just it's just so much better than a deesser and like everything else. So it's I don't know that and soothing combination like both very subtle. I, I use both. Um, yeah, too not too much of the of, of it because it's it's. You can do too much very quickly, but right. um, the combination of soothe and spiff on vocals um, is the the perfect DSR and cleanup tool. It, I don't think it gets any better. <laughs> so awesome, yeah, very cool. Well, uh, that kind of segues into what we're talking about today. We're talking about like creative ways we use tools, um, but the, the episode we're actually we're wanting to talk about mics specifically, not software, I guess. But uh, yeah. but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. So we're going to share some stories of weird creative miking um, that we did or that we've heard of. And um, yeah, we just went, like, this is one of those episodes where we just want you to think outside the box a little bit, try new stuff, come up with exciting things. So of course, you can try all these techniques or tricks that we're going to talk about. But I think the the better thing to do is take these as inspiration and then come up with your own um, things your own stuff so while these might, might work it could also be that they just don't work at all for what you're trying right. to do <laughs> but you just when we talk about them you will see that there are very unconventional things that can absolutely sound amazing and you can come up with those yourself as well and we'd love to hear about this um, as well obviously so if you have done anything like that or if you come up with anything like that after you've heard this episode just let us know and write and uh, send us an email or post it in the Facebook community because we always love these kind of things. Definitely, definitely. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear your stuff here, Malcolm, because you wrote a whole list of things in like two minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm very curious to hear all of that. And, uh, For sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, some of them worked, some of them didn't. So that's <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're not all successes. I don't really, think. <laughs> so there are some, some on this list that <laughs> you tried but they didn't work. I mean, it, it's more like some of them worked sometimes, not every time, which is, okay. of course, but uh, but yeah, <laughs> some I would totally do. Like, it's funny, I kind of go through phases with my, I call them like the auxiliary mic. It's just like, this is, we're finished micing up the kit or whatever instrument, now let's do one more thing. And just, I like think of something on the spot. And I like, it's almost, I feel like if you're not doing that, you're really missing out. It's like, you mic up a, a drum kit and you know exactly how you normally do it and that gets you exactly what you want. Now just do one more and throw it somewhere new and just see what happens. Um, you know, I try to make that an educated guess. It's not like I just like walk and close my eyes and place it somewhere. Um, but it, 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 I try to think of something new every once in a while. Normally I'll like, you know, I'll find something I like and then I'll run with that for like a few sessions and then I'll be like, okay, time, time to change it up. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that uh, there's some things like one of the things that I have on my list here that I do almost every single time just because I like it so much. But I always think I'm always thinking like, man, I should really change things up a little bit. I should do something different. But at the same time, I just like it so much that I always do it. So uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like you you figure out what it does and now it's like a new palette you can you can use um for when that's the right thing so actually you know when i really end up changing it up is when i think okay this isn't gonna like suit this project at all um like one right off the bat is uh down in the studio down the road from me uh they have this long hallway that runs out of the tracking room the live room um it's pretty far away from where the drum kit is and there's a door in the way as well 
but we throw a mic in there and it's like the darkest and so delayed because it's so far away slappy kind of uh like room mic it's just so so awesome i i can't imagine not using it when i'm there um awesome but i i had a band that wasn't looking for bombastic drums (laughs) so i was like okay we're not going to do that like there's no point in setting up that mic at all um so you know have to change it from there (laughs) yeah yeah okay for for those sort of things yeah it's just yeah just didn't fit the genre or the the vision so exactly yeah okay um so yeah just why don't you start just tell me about the the, those things like um the hallway mic of course yeah you you always you already talked about that but um some of the more unconventional funny things that you did yeah, the first one is the tree mic, which I might have even mentioned earlier, like way at the beginning of the show. When we started this podcast, that was probably my favorite thing to do. <laughs> and that's like an SM57 thrown into this literal tree trunk in the studio. <laughs> Same studio, Silverside Sound. They have uh, like this giant, giant tree root just like strapped to a wall. It's just like all roots and gnarly and it looks crazy cool. Um, so we, I found this like little spot that an SM57 57 kind of just like fits like a glove (laughs) slides into (laughs) and uh then that you know i typically i just crush it with something like 1176 and uh the first time we did it it was like magic it was like this is awesome sounding it really suits what we're doing and i used it heavily in the mix um and then every time after that it was a flop (laughs) but i stuck with it for so long because of how happy i was the first time (laughs) um but uh it was just kind of a fun thing but it was like okay there's this giant tree in the studio that's pretty rare i gotta throw a mic in it and see what happens <laughs> okay so um, so you would need if you're listening right now you would need a tree in your practice space or whatever to, in order to be able to do that so <laughs> yeah yeah if you don't have a tree you're missing out no i'm joking by the um, way there was the story of like um another engineer that I um, I had on my other podcast, on the Outback Recordings podcast, Jan Kersha. He has a great studio. He runs a great studio, like three hours from me, something like that. And they have big, huge live room. And they, he told me that one day they decided to put a tree, like they just got a tree from somewhere from the woods, and they put that whole tree with leaves and branches and all and put it into the live room just because it looked so cool for their videos and just they like the vibe of uh, of having a big tree in their live room. That's pretty and, hilarious. Yeah, and, and they, like they had it there until the leaves started to fall off and you could hear like the noise from the leaves in the room when they were dry <laughs> and everything. So at some point they just had to get rid of the tree because you always heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds of nature. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, trees and live rooms seem to be a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's too funny. Um, it, that reminded me, because in the same studio, uh, it used to be a winery. That's what the, oh. the room was originally. It was a winery. So there's this giant big wine cask oh, in there, like good. a big barrel. And uh, this tree mic kind of led to us wanting to figure out what the wine cask would sound like. So we of course. took out like the cork. <laughs> and <laughs> again, SM57 kind of fit in the hole. Um, shoved it in there and it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> it had like a note, you know, like it was like a moong, 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 oh, yeah. moong. It was like, okay, that's not going to work for anything. <laughs> uh, but we had to try. <laughs> yeah, of course you had to try. I mean, you always need to try those things. I think I mentioned it before in another episode, but Kurt Ballou, an engineer that I admire and like really, who does really great work in the heavy music um, world, he got hired to work at, um, at another studio, so not his studio for some record and they had a for whatever reason they had a canoe on the walls mm. and he just put he couldn't resist but put a mic in like inside the canoe of course and see yep. what that sounded like i don't know if that got used if that sucked but yeah if you have a <laughs> wine cask or a canoe you gotta try it <laughs> <laughs> you have to yeah <laughs> yeah also. that's funny how about you man what's something that you've enjoyed um so when it comes to drums we're still talking about drums so one thing that I always enjoy, this is not too spectacular and I've, I've talked about it a lot, but that's just something I do all the time almost is like the um, center of kit um, omnidirectional sort of mic thing. And I, I love to use a measurement mic for this. So just the mic that came with Sonoworks or like I used a, a cheap bearing a, bearing a um, measure, measurement mic, one of those like below a hundred bucks. 
And I just put that right above the kick drum, like so that it's the same distance from the snare, kick, and rack tom, basically. And I just okay. compress it heavily. Sometimes I split it and I run one. Um, I run it through a, like some sort of distortion pedal, guitar pedal or bass pedal. I love the Senzam for this because it has some extra low end. And uh, then I run a clean pass of it as well. And um, that's just, I don't know, that's just the glue and the grit that I want in my drums. And I do that all the time. So that measurement mic can right in the center of the kit. That's one thing that I really love. Cool. And uh, I should try that. Yeah. I've got I've got like the Sonarworks reference mic, so yeah. I should give that a shot. Do that, yeah. Like you get a lot of like snap and ring from the snare drum and like tons of cool sounding like high end transients. You just gotta be careful with the ride symbol because that's gonna be next to it. So that's mm. the only downside really. But other than that, kick snare and toms really sound cool. So yeah, that's the thing. And then what I um actually enjoyed as well, but I didn't do it as often. I I need to try it again. Um, is I put a lav mic on the drummer. So just the, the sort of mics that you see from video people, like you can put it on your shirt or somewhere like these small, mostly black, invisible sort of mics. And uh, I just did that and see. I just wanted to hear what it sounds like. We thought, the, the thought process was, we wanted to have something that sounds close to what the drummer hears when they play. Like um, uh -huh. <laughs> same as with the recorder man where you have the mic over the shoulder of the drummer. But we just right. figured what would it sound like if you had an omnidirectional like um, lav mic on the drummer, and it didn't sound as we expected it to. But but it sounded very no. cool. It's cut, it <laughs> like it distorted a little, it clipped a little, it added extra punch and uh, attack to the snare. And what's also cool was it added like of course some sort of movement to the drums, which was actually pretty cool because the the mic is not still. The drummer moves, you know, so. You got a little bit like it wasn't as weird as we thought it would be, but it was actually kind of cool to have this. Yeah, I don't know. It did a cool thing. I could just <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. Um, it was subtle enough to not be annoying, but it was a little bit of excitement and movement, and it was a little bit of clipping in there in a cool way. Um, the symbols were better than we thought it would they would be. So yeah, interesting. I would have thought they would have been awful. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they were beautiful, but not as awful as you would think. So, right. depends on the lav mic, maybe. But like, it was a like the the road. I don't know what it's what it's called. Um, I think it's called lav mic <laughs> by road. I think they don't have a fancy name for it. Like, but the, the the basic road one. That but that's what what I've used. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, Perfect. it worked. So I'm have to try that. Yeah, you can also, yeah. by the way, you can also use. Um, that's not on the list here, but that's also a cool thing that I tried. You can use earbuds as microphones. You can. Yes. You can just hang a, a pair of earbuds on a mic stand somewhere in the room and just plug it into um, a DI box and then in, into your um, interface, and it works into your preamps, and it really works. These are just like speakers are microphones in reverse, basically. So you can use earbuds, you can use headphones, all sorts of things. So that works as well. Yeah, so yeah, that. definitely. I've been meaning to try that out. I've got a, a buddy who does that all the time, and he makes some pretty cool stuff. Um, so that's on my list. I like that. I'm going to write that down so I remember to do it today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the lav mic thing um, I was at the studio in Toronto and they talking to the engineers there um, and they said that Jakir King came in one time to work in their studio and I was like well that's pretty amazingly cool Jakir is like one of the, one of the biggest producers in history oh, yeah. um, you know this like a legend and, and unbelievably talented obviously I'm, I'm a huge fan of his work so I was like extra stoked. And I guess he was there because they were thinking about doing a, like a Tom Waits biopic kind of thing um, where, you know, there'd be actors playing Tom Waits kind of thing and, and, and making a movie about Tom Waits. And they wanted to see if they could get live audio from the actors slash musicians. Um, so they brought in Jakir King to engineer a, a, like a test run of it. And they didn't want to see Mike. So, so he had to like apparently mic up the whole band with just lav mics oh, hidden wow. around and and they like had one like you know like along the top of the acoustic guitar kind of like taped away hidden and then like on the floor is boundary mics and stuff um wow. <laughs> and apparently the, the the engineer said that it was the best sounding thing he'd ever heard come out of the studio 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's Shakir King. Um, yeah, just makes anything work, apparently. <laughs> yeah, but th- that's such a valuable lesson as well here because no matter what you have, what gears you have, what tricks you use, no matter what you're trying to copy, it, everything you do always runs through your own unique personal filter, like your ears, your brain, the way you perceive it and you, the way you think. So you can, like, use presets and copy mic techniques and learn and, and do whatnot, like whatever you want, as long as you want, but it will never, never, ever sound like a Shakira King production because no, it's his ears and his, like whatever it is. So that's a valuable lesson here. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a challenge to make stuff. The whole band sound good with lav mics. That is oh. not, <laughs> not going to be a good time. Trust me as somebody that works with lav mics pretty often. <laughs> It's hard to make a, like a, somebody talking sound good. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so, so yeah, that's cool. I'd love to hear. Is that what record is that or what movie or what? Is that? It never got made, I oh, guess. Okay, um, okay. So that unfortunately that is lost to time. I have no idea where those recordings would be, but it would be fantastic to hear them. Oh okay, yeah, it would definitely. That's the closest I ever got to Tom or to uh, to Jakir King. <laughs> <laughs> Just a story. I was in the same room that he was once in. <laughs> <laughs> which which is cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, awesome. So, let's let's keep moving. Yeah. We got quite a few on here, actually. We're going to cover drums, bass, guitar, and vox. We just kind of like made a couple things. Yeah. And I, so we should have actually ended with drums because we have so many. <laughs> yeah, totally. But, <laughs> but yeah. Wh- whatever. Yeah. Um, my latest one that I'm really into is uh, a lot of isolation booths use like just, you know, like some uh, PCB type. Uh, tubing kind of connecting the walls you know like just as a little place to shove cables through and sometimes there's foam in there to kind of seal it up or whatever um that's just a common way people seem to do that and i decided to stick a mic into that hole the other day so there's like the live room and then there's a vocal booth and i went into the vocal booth and then shoved a little mic into the tube that would be used to run cables into the vocal booth usually um and it was awesome it sounded super cool. It was? <laughs> uh, it was like a total home run. I, really? I'm totally going to do that for the next year. What did it sound like? Like, what's the... It sounded... Well, first off, whenever I'm, I'm doing room mics, I'm almost exclusively looking for, like, the darkest thing I can find. Um, yeah. Like, my, my goal is dark and delay, because uh, I like bombastic room mics kind of thing. So, like, I wanted to have a pretty noticeable delay from the, the, the source. Um, and that, that hallway mic I mentioned earlier works because it's like really far away and behind a closed door. So that's definitely going to have a pretty different sound. Um, and this is kind of the same thing. It's like hearing it through a lot of filters by the time it gets to the mic and, uh, to again, compensate for making like to bias things towards being really dark, um, sounding, I usually use a ribbon mic. And in this case, it was one of those M one sixties, um, I don't even know who makes those. Biodynamic, I think? Yeah. The M160 yeah. is a Bio mic. Yeah. Yeah. So it's this weird cardioid ribbon mic, which uh, like I didn't, I don't even understand how that works because almost all ribbon mics are figure eight. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, shoved that in the hole and it was dark and punchy and, and not a lot of symbols going in there for whatever reason. Um, and and that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, did, did it did it have like the slap delay kind of character? Because what you like what people do, and uh, there's a pretty legendary effect based on that technique is you can use like a garden hose basically as mm. a slap delay, and depending on how long it is, the, you get different delay times. And there's this right Cooper time cube um, classic delay effect that's based on that exactly. It's like it sends audio through pieces of tubing, um, and yeah. So I, I I figure when you do that, what you just described, I I thought it would be maybe a similar sound. I mean, it definitely was like more slappy than I expected. I mean, it was so dark that slap isn't really the the, the word that came to mind, but it is. It, it technically is okay. that. Um, you know, it's just like you bring it up and your snare gets longer uh, because of it. So cool. it, it's definitely a really cool thing that I'm going to be trying out again next time I'm over there. Cool. Awesome. Great. And then uh, here's one that I've never had luck with, but making like a piano in the live room. <laughs> uh, you know, like they're going to be ringing away. Um, and yeah, I, just, I end up always just muting the piano and like shoving a moving blanket into it, <laughs> going the opposite way with it. But I gave it a shot. Um, 
and uh, you know i've i've heard of people like taping down the keys that are uh, or like only leaving the keys open that are in the key of the song um so like if your keys the key of the song's in c you tape down everything that's not in c um and then hopefully that resonates and you know would sound cool didn't sound cool in that example that i saw either (laughs) have you ever done that Um, and had luck no i i think that's one of those things where in theory it sounds like the best idea ever and then you try it it's just not worth it at all but um (laughs) i saw videos where it actually did work but i don't know um i i can't i can't say much about it because i don't have a, a real like piano in my life room and i've never i've never tried it so i don't know what i do like though and what i did um is like record but that's not like really that's not nearly the same thing but you can do cool tricks with pianos like uh play the fundamental notes distort them like crazy and mix them with heavy guitars and stuff like that so i've had success with all sorts of piano tricks where you don't really hear that it's a piano but Mm. like the the room reverb whatever you want to call it make the piano in the room trick i I didn't try it and um i don't know (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> worth mentioning though. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea, and I, I I can't see it working, but I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, you could. What about kick tunnels? Do you like kick tunnels? I love kick tunnels. I love Me kick too. tunnels, but you got to be very, or at least I think you got to be very careful. And like, it's really a trial and error thing for me with where to place the mic because you could end up in a spot where you have a weird or like yeah um, weak low end, and then there could be spots where it's like super big and punchy and. Um, so it, it takes a while for me to, to describe what a describe what a kick tunnel is for the audience because maybe not, not everyone knows. Yeah, there are several ways you can do that. So the most basic thing is you could just build like a fort in front of the kick drum where you just put a blanket over something uh, to isolate the cymbals and everything else in the room and just put a microphone in that like tunnel or thing you've built in front of the kick drum so that you can mic the outside of the kick drum without having all the bleed from the cymbals. But then you can build like real kick drum tunnels with like multiple kick drums. You can put a kick drum in front of a kick drum and you can put like three, four or five kick drums in front of a kick Mm -hmm. drum and build a really long tunnel that way. And um, yeah, as I said, I don't have the like the technique that I like. I I do it every once in in a while, but it's always a trial and error thing for me. I always need to figure out again um, where to put the mic, where how long to make the tunnel how much isolation I want. It's different from session to session. So I don't have this one go-to technique here, but I've had great results with it, definitely. Cool, cool. Yeah, I find when I've done it, I'm actually still miking the kick in the same spot I normally would. But then I've got a tunnel that's just sending it out into the rooms in a different way. So like the the, the original kick is still miked up, but the tunnel is just creating a different like room feel. but maybe I should experiment with that more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do the same thing. I still have a, um, like mics on the kick drum, but then I have also a mic in the tunnel or in front of the tunnel or somewhere. Yeah. And and that's always like a trial and error thing for me. But you can cool. re- get, get great results doing that. Uh, sometimes it's just, it's for me, just a, um, uh, an isolation thing because I don't want cymbals in the kick out mic, but I want more distance to the kick drum. So sometimes it's just because of that. And sometimes I do it because I like the different sort of low end and also the delay between the mics. So right, different applications here. But there's cool things you can do with a kick tunnel, definitely. So you can definitely try to um, experiment with that and come up with, with cool things here. Um, definitely. Yeah. All right. Last thing on our drum list, mic behind a cymbal. And I haven't done this, so you got to tell me what you're talking about. Yeah, that's that's actually pretty cool. Um, I picked that up in a, on another podcast, I think, um, a couple of years ago. Um, and what it is is, and I don't remember the podcast exactly because I, I thought about it, but uh, because I would mention it, but I'm not sure. So, but anyway, um, I think a couple of people do that. the The idea is you put a big symbol, like a, a riot symbol, in most cases, and um, uh, or like you. Could work with any symbol, but I like ride symbols for that. And you just put it on a stand and you kind of create a shield between the mic and the drum kit. So you mic the symbol, you get as close to the symbol as possible. And on the opposite side of the symbol, there's the drum kit. So you, yeah, you put a shield in front of the mic, basically. And what that does is okay. you the, the symbol will ring with the snare and kick and toms, but not so much with the symbol. So you get like... 
isolation, like symbol isolation, you get a darker room mic sound. Okay. Um, because the symbols, like, yeah, they don't come through as much because you have this shield in front of your capsule, of course. But the kick, snare, and toms actually get a little more, a little longer sustain because of the, the symbol that just rings with them. Oh. So it's a subtle effect, but I feel like it adds a little more... Depending on where you put it, it can sound a little more snappy or bright even in a weird way because the whole thing will be darker. But the kick and snare get this... I don't know. It's it's It must be the way that the symbol reacts. I don't know. Right. It's just some some overtones, a little bit of length, and a cool isolation so you don't have as much symbols in there. And I've experimented with a couple of different symbols, put it on different spots in the room. There's actually an example of that in my course that's about to, to uh, that I'm about to launch. So uh, there's an audio example of exactly that in there as well because I find it interesting and awesome. So yeah, you can use whatever cool. you want. Like it doesn't need to be a symbol. You can build a shield. Where, where do you normally there. place the symbol? Is that kind of up to you? At that point? It's kind of a front of kit thing. So it's a couple of feet away from the kit uh, in the room, like a mono room mic, something like cool. that. Not too far away. And um, it's the mic is aiming at the kit, but between the mic and the kit, there is the symbol. And the mic is as close to the symbol as possible. Cool. All right. It also makes a difference if you put it on the edge or the center of the symbol. It's all subtle differences, right. but there are differences. And yeah. Interesting. Okay, I'm totally going to try that. I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to hear the results. Uh, I, I, I guess thinner or thicker symbols also make a difference. I haven't tried that that as much, I think, but that could also make a difference, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it would resonate the symbol more or less. Yeah. And Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Right on. Okay. So, yeah. Let's that's jump into the, bass. Yeah, let's move on to bass. I mean, I, I, can, I could talk about tons more things with drums because it's uh, drums lend them like i don't know drum recordings um lend themselves to this sort of thing i think it's just they do yeah i mean they like they are the instrument that activates a room like nothing else really does so um it it just kind of yeah it lends itself to you see something like a canoe and you're like i wonder what that will sound like when somebody hits the snare in the room um, <laughs> yeah totally totally <laughs> which i mean like guitars and stuff get loud but they're kind of constant they're not like transient like drums are um so it it's just kind of different but yeah we do have some kind of fun things that we've done with uh other instruments so we're going to burn through them as well exactly um ever since royal blood came out i've had bass players wanting to have guitar amps in their chain um, I don't know if that's a thing over in Germany as well. <laughs> yeah, it is not so much probably, but yeah, the occasional one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, uh, yeah, I mean, I've had some fun doing it. It's like splitting, splitting a bass into like guitar amps and distortion channels and then still having a clean one and stuff. Uh, it, it, in my experience after doing that, I think like the in the box way is my preferred way of going about it. Just recording bass as usual and then splitting it into like saturn like you, the plugin you just got um, <laughs> or, or something like that you know i i haven't really actually had a, any luck with the the splitting live amps thing on a bass um other than using like uh like a dark glass or sans amp pedal and taking a split into that um but as far as like multiple amps in the room go it's just been like a mess <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of the same with, like, bass. I love splitting guitar amps, like, guitars into different amps. That actually works mm -hmm. well for me, um, different, like, with different applications. With bass, not so much. You're right. But what I like is, it, but it's it's just that the combination doesn't work for me, maybe because of cancellations or whatever, because what I do like is a guitar amp on bass instead of a pedal. So when I split it in the, in the box, in the DAW, I often use for the, the distortion, the, the distorted high-end channel, top-end channel, I often use guitar amps, actually, or guitar amp sims, mm -hmm. because they they just work, especially for metal tones. They can work very well, or heavier tones. So I really like guitar amps on bass. I just think that it's that in the room it's difficult because, like, yeah, because of low end that's canceling and that's basically everywhere yeah, get, in the room. And you can't really isolate that stuff. It's so... Like the lower you get, the more omnidirectional it is. It's you, there's not much it's you can like do. It's like a phase mess. Yeah, it's a phase it's, mess. Yeah, it's very soupy. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that's the <laughs> reason. It, so, wow. It'll eat up time in a session like nobody's business as well. You'll spend hours trying to figure that stuff out, and then yep. you'll finally convince them to just record a DI and 
do it another yeah. way. <laughs> but I was about to say, you can do that. I mean, you can always like record through a guitar amp and track the DI at the same time. You've technically split it as well then. Yeah. And that works way better. Um, so yeah, that's the that's thing that I do a lot actually, but I don't bother using multiple bass amps usually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm over with you, but I've tried it. It was worth mentioning. Um, yeah. Yes. I would love to see how they do the Royal Blood stuff because that does sound amazing. Those records are great sounding. They do a fantastic job with those. It does. It does. It does. Um, I'm not sure how they do it. I assume um, that you gotta, you just gotta control the low end, and you gotta. I don't think you need as much low end. I think you need a tight control low end, and. Um, yeah, I also wonder how much is doubled mm. rather than split on those records because they got like panning and stuff. And, yeah. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of stuff. Got to dissect it a little more. Yeah, um, but it's a, it's a very cool sound that's become very popular. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, feel free to try and do it that way. But I would recommend an in the box approach. Yes, totally. More so, totally. Um, the only other really kind of, and it's kind of weird that this is considered weird, but uh, setting up room mics on a bass isn't isn't that common. Um, people tend to just go for the very direct thing. But I've had some great luck with room mics on on bass. It, it can sound very, very interesting. Yes, sometimes. Yeah, you're totally right. I when I use them, I often like high pass them. So I, I, lo, I put a low cut, cut at like 400 or whatever, 300, 400, mm -hmm. and then I make them super wide. I use I like stereo room mics then because yeah, if you blend that in, you can just get the bass to be a little wider. You like you, I don't know. It's almost like. Sometimes these things are so hard to describe because usually <laughs> you have a bass up the like right up the middle that it's, it's a mono thing it's pretty narrow um and that's what you want most of the time but it can be pretty cool to also have some of that information on the sides not the low end but just some of the bass and it kind of it's still as loud as it was in the center but it it feels like it's there's more space in the center in a way mm -hmm. and it also blends well with the guitars and it's just yeah it can be a cool thing to have some sort of stereo aspect to a bass guitar just subtle and just low in volume but it can be cool and when one and one way to do that is with room mics on bass you're totally right yeah 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 i i the reason of getting it to blend more into the guitars is the, the reason i like it um it's definitely just like that little bit of stereo information kind of like lets it touch the guitars on the sides and it kind of glues it all together yeah a little bit of chorus on those as well sounds pretty mm -hmm. awesome yeah so definitely yeah. yeah, that's something, just a side tangent, but like, because normally you don't get a room mic when somebody sends you tracks to mix. That's on a bass. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I, I'm lately I'm often splitting a channel, doing the same thing, high passing it, and then some chorus to make it wide, um, and, and then mixing that in there, usually subtly. And that, yeah, that goes a long way. Yeah, agreed. Cool. Um, that's it basically for bass, I think. I don't have mm -hmm. any weird things that I like to do with basses. I don't know. <laughs> Insist that they use a pick, uh, new strings. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Can't say that often enough, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with bass, it's, it's really like, you can get very creative with bass, of course, but it's that's a thing that I do after it's recorded more than I do yeah. it during the it's recording. It's more of a, a mixing thing, yeah. usually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> so, guitars, that's where it gets interesting again. Um, so, room mics, same as with bass, not so common as with drums to use room mics on guitars. It, it depends on the genre. In, in some cases, it is common, but like the heavier or the rock stuff is usually pretty in your face and pretty close to the cap. So, but room mics on guitars can work well. Um, any specific things you think of or any specific techniques here for the room mic on a guitar I, I tend to be kind of on the closer side um it it just kind of becomes so trebly that like if you go far away that it's kind of useless to me um so I, I end up being pretty close but it's just like sometimes it sounds too direct for whatever style of music so bring it up um and then again sometimes maybe you're doing like a clean intro part or something and you just want wish there was some width to it um, so like a little XY pair pretty close to the amp can really just bring that in. Um, it's yeah, nothing groundbreaking here as far as guitars go, but it's just, again, I feel like people don't use room mics enough and it's worth, worth trying. Uh, one weird room mic situation actually is I had a guy, um, recording in, in the live room 
and it, it's shed monkeys again. I always talk about shed monkeys, but they're just the best. Um, <laughs> uh, and he had like, you know, we had like three amps in there and he's got like this big, huge, giant fuzz pedal set up going on. He's a, he's a monster. Like he's just got tone in his hands. Like you could turn all the pedals off and it would still be the heaviest thing you heard. <laughs> and uh, I threw a talkback mic in there for him and I forgot to mute it and I accidentally recorded it. And it was awesome. It was like this SM58 pointing the wrong way beside his head, you know. <laughs> you can like hear the scrape of the pick in it and stuff um because it's like so close to him and and he's in the room with the amps and stuff right so it's uh it, it was just like chaos but it was like the perfect chaos and well, it, it was so like in, instrumental into the tone of those songs it was so great oh that's that's cool that's i need to try that that's actually pretty pretty good yeah it's like a happy accident but it, yeah. it totally worked in did, this case <laughs> did you do it again after that we did because we did another bunch of songs and I set up the talk back and I made sure to record it. But in this case, it, it, it didn't, the magic <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you could do pretty exciting things that way. You could also mic just, you could mic the, the electric guitar just as you would an acoustic guitar and blend in the yep. strumming and pick noise and finger noise and stuff like that. Definitely, definitely, which is probably what I should have gone for because that's like really what I liked about the first time was that i could hear that stuff not him breathing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah cool that's that's actually cool um yeah so room mics um, with room mics i've mentioned it in another episode and um, what i like with guitar room mics sometimes is that i when i track the whole band and if i track everything in the same room i just leave the drum overheads up for everything else so i just record guitars and just record the drum overheads in the same spot as they were with the drums. And I do the same for bass and vocals and everything. And if I need a little glue, a little extra, um, yeah, uh, sense of, of cohesiveness, then I just blend in those those overheads. Because, yeah, that's a yeah, really great idea. Yeah, so it's, it just gives overdubs more of a band in a room feel. So, Right. Yeah, I get that for sure. Um, I sometimes do something a little similar, but it's my room pair. That kind of just stays put for the whole session. Yeah. Usually. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, then the, the splitting thing with guitars actually works pretty well, I think. So you can obviously just combine different types of guitar amps. That's always fun to do. And when I do stuff like that, I tend to go for the extremes because two similar amps, all you get with like using similar setups and splitting, and splitting it between those, at least in my experience, is face problems because it's like, yeah too similar and it's not really worth doing it but if the two things that you're going to use are not similar at all if they are very different there is not much um they won't have much in common also when it comes to face so it's it's easier to blend them and uh, i as always when i blend things same with, with with microphones i like to blend extremes i like to have two faders with completely different things on them that i can blend and make one sound out of them so for example, when I track a really heavy modern band, I set up one amp that's 5150 or a Mesa or something like that, like a heavy or a Bachner or whatever, like a heavy high gain amp, maybe a little scoop, like the typical modern metal sound. But then I'll add to that something like, an, I don't know, an AC30 or um, maybe a Marshall or maybe some pocket amp that's got a lot of mid-range but nothing else. So just something right. to add to the, the other amp. Um, to give it something that it doesn't have. Um, so that can work pretty well. Also, I like blending. That That's probably my favorite thing. I like blending an Ampac V4 bass amp. And I crank like everything, like the mid-range, the, um, the gain and the master volume. And you can use a power soak so that it's like um, not super loud. But that thing is just such a great guitar amp with such a cool sort of mid-range. It's that Queens of a Stone Age sort of tone. They use that amp all the time on guitars. And if right. you like dial back the low end and just use it for the mid-range and the distortion from it, it's such a cool vibe and grit that I only get from this amp. And I love blending the V4 with other guitar amps. So Cool. Cool. Yeah, I don't I don't do much blending. I'm pretty like like often I'll just use one mic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> like me not too. even two mics. I'm just like the one gets the job done. But it it, it definitely does happen, and and uh, yeah, it, it just depends. I think it depends how big the tone needs to be, and, and it, like maybe the the more distorted, the more I'm curious about bringing in like additional tones to kind of supplement things and and fill because like really heart, heavy tones like at one amp kind of 
there's always like a sacrifice to for getting it as heavy as you want. So uh, they try to make up for it with like, yeah, like you said, like a Vox or something is going to bring kind of like a cleaner mid-range presence back into it or something. Yeah. That's when I kind of go down yeah. that road. Um, yeah, now you were mentioning earlier uh, splitting for, for base purposes. Um, and I want to dive into that a little bit. Um, maybe talk about what, what you did and then I can share my story as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, I think there's... That's that's nothing to do with uh, like the usual split your guitar to get to blend the guitar tone thing. But that was what I did there was I had a band in the studio. They were two people, a drummer and the guitar player. And the guitar player was also the vocalist. And they had no bassist and they didn't want to play bass on the record as well. So we need to figure out a way to make to get the low end we needed from the guitar and the sound like a fuller sound than just the guitar, his, his guitar sound with the drums. So what mm. we did was we split the guitar and we used the bass amp and a guitar amp, but not in the way that I just described with the V4, but we used the clean bass amp. Um, we dialed back all the mid-range and top end. We just left the low end in there, basically. We uh, made sure it's clean and big. We put the biggest, thickest string on his guitar that we could fit on there, um, the lowest string. Um, we figured out a different way to tune and a different way to play mm. the songs, actually. So we really did like everything. We redid everything from scratch so that it would work. And then he basically was able to play all the chords with one finger on the low string and play the bass note along with the chords, basically. And what that did was we had that... It, it was hard to get the guitar to stay in tune, basically. So because of that one really thick string and the rest were like some right. some other... Uh, set of strings, so it was kind of weird, but we we uh, uh, got it done, and yeah, what that did was it kind of sounded like a bass and a guitar playing at the same time, <clears throat> but obviously very in time because it was the same performance. But it really sounded right. weird. It sounded like a very very tight double, and like the bass amp didn't get much of the um, the other strings because we like really just kept the low end, and for the guitars uh, on the guitar amp we like dialed back the low end and just kept the mid-range and top end and distortion. And this sounded pretty filtered and kind of weird, but also pretty cool. So yeah, it was just our way of playing guitar and bass at the same time. And I think right. we didn't even use a guitar string on the, as an E string. I think we put on a G string from a bass or something like that. Right. It's like awesome. the thickest uh, thing we could fit on there. So yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, the it's pretty similar to what I went through, um, but the band I had in actually, like that's their thing already. Like he has a bass amp on stage; he's already doing this. Um, what what's that uh, knob on the back of a subwoofer called? Is it like the cross? Uh, uh, crossfade's coming to mind, but it's not called a crossover. Crossfade, but it, crossover, crossover frequency. Yeah, he, so he had a crossover built into his pedal board to to only send a certain frequency point and lower to his bass chain. Um, so it would go through a totally different set of pedals and uh, into a bass amp. Um, and he had it set pretty accurately so that like a lot of notes wouldn't even make it there really, right? Uh, so yeah. it was pretty much just like his low low E string getting through to that. And then he already had like processing for it. I, I did so much on that session because I like didn't know what to expect. So I grabbed like a clean DI of the guitar, a wet DI of the guitar chain, the amp as well and then we had a clean of the bass signal a clean di of it and then like the process signal of it and the bass amp being mic'd up and, and then i think i had a kemper going on some i think the kemper was running on the amp side of things maybe it was on the bass side of things but it was like like seven or eight lines running for this one guitarist it was insane uh, yeah yeah i mean yeah same thing same idea basically um yeah, but yeah, they wanted to track live, and like he's the bassist and the guitar, so we had to we had to get it going that way, and uh, it worked. It totally worked. Cool, cool. Yeah, try try those things out. Um, sometimes those, like, yeah, when you need to solve a problem like that, cool things can happen. So definitely. Um, yeah. All right. What else do we have here? Leslie speaker. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean, this is just yeah. like a fun thing that a band brought in a Leslie speaker for the guitar once, and I was like, "This is the coolest sounding thing ever." <laughs> but I mean, there's not like really any engineering going on there. That's just the band happened to have a Leslie speaker. So if you can track one of those down, it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
It does. Then uh, we got to talk about your beer, Mike. I know we've talked about this some, at some point on the podcast before, but I think so. it's just such a good story. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I mean, I'll be quick. The, the, the thing was, I was tracking a band and there was a song about, or some songs, but one in particular, about drinking and about um, the, a day in the life of a pretty miserable um, person. <laughs> um, like, and this song is like, it's almost like a, a story. So not only the lyrics, but the music itself is telling a story. So the way everything sounds kind of fits the lyrics and like walks you through the whole the whole story. And there's ups and downs in the life of someone who has a serious like drinking problem. And at some point in the song, we wanted to have a part that sounds disgusting, like when you, you you're just about to throw up, basically. Um, and we <laughs> wanted to to have that sort of sound. We wanted we wanted the part to sound as if someone is like almost throwing up. And we tried a couple of different things and what we could do. And what we ended up with was the idea was we started with a bottleneck because a bottleneck already sounds kind of you know like this loose, mm. yeah undefined thingy so the, the guitar player played some chords used the bottleneck and made some like yeah chords that we thought would fit the, the part then we reversed it so we played it back backwards and then reamped it so that already felt pretty weird those bottleneck chords and and like slides and then backwards reamped and then we put um a glass the first idea was we put a glass of water in front of the amp and put the mic underwater to make it sound more, even more weird and distant and like disgusting in a way, and then we thought if we gonna if we're gonna do that and it just fit the band as well. If you knew the band, like it, water didn't make sense, so we needed to mm. use beer for that. So we got beer and we needed to have a certain kind of beer. The singer insists that that if we use beer, we need to use the sort of beer that he always likes to drink because otherwise, like everything else just won't work. So we got <laughs> that sort of enough. beer. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it wasn't authentic enough. Exactly. Exactly. So we need to get we needed to get that sort of beer. We put it into an authentic like Bavarian beer glass with like deer engraved in it and trees and everything. <laughs> like you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> We put that in front of the guitar cap. We put an SM57 in a, like a plastic bag and we wrapped it in a, in a plastic bag and a rubber band. And then we just dumped it into the, the glass of beer. Uh, and then we played back, we reamped the reverse bottleneck chords. So that all already sounded kind of weird. And we knew that it was going to, um, it, it was recorded through beer. So that was cool, but it still didn't have the effect that we wanted. So it was still not disgusting enough. So what we did was, the guitar player went into the live room, um, went in front of the cab and put a straw in the in the glass of beer. And then he made bubbles with that straw uh, so that there was movement in front of the mic and underwater. So you have these this weird bubbly underwater sound with reversed bottleneck chords actually recorded through a glass of beer. And that was exactly what we were looking for. And now when that part comes up, you cannot tell how that's done, it just really sounds disgusting. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's weird. Uh, I, I, I'm curious, uh, it would have been funny to do a test to see if different beers had different tones. Like if you got a Guinness in there, is it going to be like a darker, more thick tone? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you would think so. So I don't know. Yeah, you would think. Uh, but that's yeah, funny. but it was definitely a fun, awesome. a fun thing to do. And it, I was kind of surprised that water alone or beer alone didn't make that much of a difference. I mean, it got darker. It was kind of a filter, but it was not nearly as drastic as I thought it would be. So we really needed huh. to have that bubbly sound in there to to really make sure that it sounds like underwater. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> right on. I got to post a picture of that in the show notes. I have a yeah. Oh yes, do do. It's a great photo. I remember when you posted that into like our group thread. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. Total side note, but when I went to India to record some drummers with the documentary I work on, um, there was a drummer called Suvamani who had like this these symbols like attached to a string that he would hit and he would dip them into water, and it was totally wild sounding because they would change the pitch of the symbol as it entered the water. Oh. Um, it was yeah, like boing, kind of like thing, and it was really really crazy. Um, and then yeah, we also recorded this other guy that had like 
drums that floated in buckets of water and they had different pitches because of it. Like you had to like have the perfect amount of water in there. It was crazy cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I figured that you, you probably saw a lot of like crazy or creative making techniques on your, like that whole documentary journey. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I mean, a lot of it's trying to keep the mics out of the shot. So I have to be creative that way. How can I get as close okay. without being in the shot? And then sometimes I'm just like, I'm in the shot, guys. Like, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> yeah. um, cool. Just depends on like the situation we are or if we're outside, you know, if we're outside, I got to get close because there's so much noise. Um, but if we're in a studio, I can probably make some room mics in an overhead sound awesome, you know, with a uh, clever placement. Cool. Um, but yeah, <laughs> some interesting drums and performances. That's That's the coolest part. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the last thing we need to talk about is vocals, um, and uh, nothing, nothing too crazy here, because we've talked about this a lot. We had like episodes about being more creative with. Uh, well, it just came up in reamping because we talked about sending vocals through pedals and stuff, <laughs> which is like yeah. one thing. Um, so setting up like an additional vocal mic, which you're going to do something different with, is kind of a cool thing you can try, um, or you can just you know have a parallel process of of the vocal in the mix but having a different mic is kind of a way to do it in real time that's kind of fun um and then uh the other thing that i'm really into which i may have mentioned on the podcast before but is actually just getting like another double of a performance so say they sing the verse and it's perfect that's your lead vocal get them to do it one more time and then use that as say your reverb um channel so rather than throwing reverb on the lead vocal you're just doing a 100% wet blend of reverb on this uh, totally different performance. And I'm really enjoying doing that because you get like subtle differences between the two performances. And it's like, it just feels different. Um, you still want it to be pretty close. I don't want it to be distracting. But uh, it, it's a total different sound than if you have it on the on the same vocal. Yeah, I agree. That, that's that's uh, a thing that I like a lot. Uh, it even makes a difference if you like send an uncompressed thing to reverb compared to like the compressed process thing. That's already a difference. But if it's a completely different performance, uh, that's very interesting for sure. Yeah, you're gonna have slight variances in there, and uh, yeah, yeah. Like e even other instruments. Like I've, I do that with lead guitars sometimes. Get them to do like another pass of like a solo or something, and then that becomes the big delay track kind of thing. That can be really cool. Um, just give you more options and it, it's something that's a little more unusual so it just stands out your ears like what what's different here cool um which is always always cool i don't really do any like room mics on vocals unless i'm in like a church or something you know that mm -hmm. really projects vastly like that um but generally recording studios are more on the controlled side um so it's just it, it's never really been worthwhile yeah, same here. I don't do that as well. Um, yeah. yeah. What I do like, that's the last thing I have to offer you with like vocal mics. What I do like is the fact that you can, especially when you do heavier or grittier vocals, the fact that you can scream into almost anything and record it. So anything can be a microphone and that's pretty cool. So you can use a guitar pickup and just put it into a DI box or whatever. You can do, or you can like literally grab your guitar, just scream into it and record that. It will work. Um, yep. You can grab, like, you can use old phone. Um, what's the English word for it? Like the the part of the phone with, wait, is it the microphone or what? I don't know what it's called. It. Yeah, I guess it's the microphone of a okay. phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can scream into old parts of like telephones if you like just cut the wire and like solder a, a plug, an XLR to it or whatever. So uh, you can scream into speakers, headphones. Um, that's also pretty cool. Like a, just a pair of uh, like over ear like headphones that you could just hold in your hand and scream into it that has a cool sound um mm -hmm. so anything that's a speaker or some sort of microphone can be used for that and i've had a lot of fun with those types of things for certain parts or certain doubles um right. yeah that's that's basically all i'm all i'm experimenting with there is a cool microphone for um that telephones radio sort of effect that we all have heard a, a couple of uh, like a million times, but yeah. it does it in a cooler, better way. I didn't spend money on it because I thought only for that it's a little too. I I don't I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. uh, if you feel like if you want to have something fancy, there is a microphone called the Copperphone. I don't know if you know that. 
That no. sounds really, really amazing. Like re it has a really cool tone. Yeah, you can't get the same thing with just filtering and distortion. So it is the radio or telephone effect, but in a very cool way. So I've heard it a couple of times and it always sounded great, but I just can't, I just didn't want to uh, justify or I couldn't justify spending a lot of money on, on such a <laughs> thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a fancy way of doing a thing. Well, maybe there's a Black Friday deal. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, it's like two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Yeah, that's a little bit much for the the radio effect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But it it does sound cool. Really, it does really sound cool. So, um, but that's basically all I do with vocals. Like as I said, I leave the overheads up sometimes. I use pedals for vocals. I have them scream into different sorts of phones or speakers or pickups. But other than that, um, there's not like a, a a position in the room or anything like that that I like for. For vocals no it's, it's certain instruments lend themselves yeah. to being messed with while you track and certain instruments lend themselves to being messed with in the mix um and drums are one of those things that's definitely like a you can really manipulate it on the way in very easily um where vocals are more about just getting a, a clean vocal and then from there you can take it yeah i think so I yeah think so all right cool well, hopefully that was a fun episode for our listeners it was fun i think to talk so about. Def definitely definitely it's one of those things where it's so hard to describe at least for me when it's not like english is not my native language so i do my best but whenever i try to describe cool abstract things it's kind of hard to to describe those things i i know in my head what i want to describe and i hear it but it's so hard to describe it but uh yeah it's fun talking about those things and uh i think the most important takeaway here is just that you experiment with stuff like that yeah definitely uh yeah i hope some people try stuff we mentioned in this episode and we get to hear about the results that'd be great yeah totally cool thank you for listening and by the way uh before we leave here the last thing i want to say is episode 29 and episode 21 of our podcast are related to what we've been talking about today 21 is called spice up your recordings with creative reamping and unique effects so it's basically what we've been talking about this time but it's not about mic positioning but instead it's about running your already recorded stuff through gear and cool thing uh, cool things and then we have episode 29 um which is called how do you develop a unique drum sound which is also like the things we've been talking about today are part of that um, answer to that as well so if you want to check out some of our older episodes these two are a great start if you want to uh, learn more about those the creative side of things yeah definitely all right thank you for listening well, i gotta run to a session yeah <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for listening bye and we'll definitely see you next week